great. I uh, really appreciate it, especially considering the up and down weather we've had been having. And uh, it is a Saturday, which tends to be a lazy day. And this is a talk, it's not an actual uh, exhibition of artwork, but just a conversation, so we know that those don't generally bring very many people. So thank you guys for coming out. Um, I want to thank also the Mac for having us here today. Um, they've been very generous uh, with their time and their spaces with us, and so I want to say thank you to them, as well as for the refreshments they provided for us. And of course, thank you to our speakers, our conversation starters who will be with us here today. Um, much appreciation. Com. I have bumper stickers if you want one. And uh, it's just started, uh, I'll, I'll be really brief here. Um, I live on the east side and I have for 10 years and I just got my latest appraisal and I'm going to be pushed out of my neighborhood very soon. I'm going to have to leave. Um, really tired of what's happening. And so I decided the, to go to all the places I've lived in Austin since I got here 24 years ago and describe the places, what they were valued at then, what the rents were, what they're appraised at now, what the taxes are, and also trace the history of raising my son as a single mom in these places and what kind of work I was doing at the time and how I was able to afford to live here as a single mom making a very small amount of money and now I can't, I make, I have a good job and it's, I still am going to get pushed. So, and soon I'm going to open up the blog and invite other people to attend their awesome streets. Uh, Lynn Osgood, I'm an urban planner. I teach planning at UT and um, also running right now the Drawing Lines Project, which is looking at putting artists in each of the new council districts to see what, what we've created with our new political building. And I'm very, very honored to have those outsiders support that. Thank you. I'm Deborah Roberts. I'm an artist that I'm born in Austin, so I'm an Austinite, very few of us. And I went away to get my master's degree. I'm back, and Austin has totally changed. And so I'm just going to talk about that. And Deborah has worked in the show. Yes, I have worked in the show. Candace Persenia, a local artist, uh, born and raised in Austin. Went away to Chicago for my MFA at Artists of Chicago, and I'm also in the show as well. Fidencio Duran, I'm a painter and a muralist, and I've uh, lived in Austin since 1980. I've never really left Austin. I've worked in other parts of the state uh, as an artist in education. Um, and I always came back to Austin, so I've, I've lived in most parts of Austin, and I've seen the changes, and they've been pretty slow in, in my view since 1980. Uh, I never lived in East Austin, so I don't know uh, what that's all about. I've always just uh, gone wherever I could. And I've been, Fortunate that I've been able to find places where I can work uh, in a relatively good good environment. But I'll talk about whatever experiences I've had that may help anybody. Uh, Michael Anthony Garcia, uh, visual artist and uh, member, co founder of Los Outsiders Art Collective, uh, who curated Gently Fry. I'm Rebecca Marino. I've been here for about 10 years now, and since 2007, I've been working with Pump Project, which is a, a nonprofit 
art organization down on uh, 7th and Shady Lane on the east side. Um, and the gallery director there. Hi, I'm Salvador Castillo. Um, I guess I'm an independent curator. I like to think of myself as an instigator. Uh, <laughs> a member of Los Outsiders Art Collective. Evelina Zamora, manager of the MAC. And uh, I'll be Jaime of the Outsiders invited me because of everything that's happening, of course, here um, with the MAC and Rainy Street neighborhood. Um, and also at a personal level, uh, you know, I wanted to buy a home last year, and it, at, for a single person, it was so difficult for me to find a home. And I really wanted to live in East Austin, but it was incredibly difficult. And um, and so uh, I ended up moving to um, Dove Springs neighborhood, and um, I'm scared that you know some of the development might start happening there too. Um, I'm hoping and praying that it's not going to happen. Time soon, but you never know. And I've lived here over 20 years. I, I also worked at Mexico Art the Museum downtown, and that's kind of when the development started happening as well. Um, with Frost Bank, it started with Frost Bank. You know, it's like that was like the tallest building downtown, and you know we fought for that too, and the city fought for it. And you know there was a lot of controversy with that, but now it's probably one of the tiniest buildings downtown. So. So since I've lived here, I, I've seen it um, just change throughout Austin. And so I'll be talking a little bit, too, about all the things that have been happening. And, and I'm so glad Theo's here, too, because he can also um, talk about this neighborhood and just in such a small little neighborhood, what has happened. I'm Trey Rebel, I'm fellow Austin, native Austinite and visual artist. And I started uh, an organization called Big Media. I'm Zaire Nopi, I'm a uh, newly elected city council member from District 3. And I'm also a native of Austinite. Uh, here at the end of this month, I'll be celebrating my 65th birthday. So uh, I've seen a lot of changes here in Austin. Some that are very good and some that are very bad, you know. But, uh, you know, we're living in a society that's always changing. And, uh, and so we need to really, you know, I'm focusing on trying to bring in affordable housing and, and keep it where the, the, uh, the, our renters, which, which is uh, the ones that are being affected the most, you know, even though we're paying high uh, taxes as homeowners, but the renters are the ones that are really getting displaced, displaced very quickly. And a lot of our artists are also uh, renters, you know, they're, uh, I, I'm known of, of many of those that are, are very are really struggling just to make ends meet, and we we need to go out there and find affordable housing for these people because you know even we, we know that if they leave then they take a, a, a part of Austin with them you know and, and that'll be very unfortunate for the city if we start losing it just uh, artists. Just the people that you know are, they like, you know, they're really creative people. And they do bring in a lot to Austin, you know, that our economy is really uh, relying on people that are artists. So. But I'll be talking about that later. Hi, everybody. I'm Robert Jackson Harrington. I'm a visual artist and the newest member of Los Outsiders. Uh, I'm originally from El Paso, Texas, and I've been here since. separate the native Austin? I don't think I've ever been <laughs> 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 so many in the same room. <laughs>
because we know that they've been extreme, particularly in the last 10 years. Um, how many people here know the New York area? There a little bit? I, I came here about 11 years ago with my family, and we came for the game industry. And when we and I, we'd never seen Austin before. We just you know took a job and came in. We first came in, well, you know, drove up Congress Avenue, and I was like, oh, it's like White Plains, which is really this kind of nothing place where there's really no there there. It's just it was just buildings, and and now we know a completely different city. When I arrived, people would talk about um, how they they really did, didn't like the fact that Austin was no longer a small town. But those, I don't hear those conversations anymore. And so we, we've been undergoing these, these huge shifts. And so I just wanted to put some numbers to them um, to just sort of help paint a context. Um, a couple of years ago, Forbes magazine said that we were the fastest growing city in the US. We, we've lost that standing right now. It's actually Houston. Um, but we're still, but we're second. And that's an incredible growth rate of about, it's about two and a half percent. And when you do the numbers, that's over 20,000 new people moving to Austin every year. That's, that's an incredible amount of growth to, to, to take in. Um, what does that mean on a, on a personal level? I think we all feel it most with housing. And uh, the, the, um, in the last two decades, Austin has gone from the least expensive housing market of the four major cities in Texas to the most expensive. And just some, some figures around that. The average rent in Austin increased from 50% from 2004 to 2013, while our incomes, median family incomes, only rose by 9%. So that's the juxtaposition of this. Um, usually when, they're when folks are figuring out housing costs and what's reasonable to pay, they think pay, we should be paying about 30% of our income towards housing. But in Austin today, 50% of renters pay more than 30%, and 28% of homeowners pay more than 30%. That means 80% of Austinites are paying much more than they should just for housing alone. And when you take you know, pieces of the pie, that means you're taking out other things. Um, some of our, our larger demographic trends. What, what does this all this growth mean? Well, I, if you look at the center core, a lot of it means that we're losing families. Families, you know, the you know, mom and dad who are starting out and their kids, they, they can't afford to live in the urban core anymore. In uh, 1970, we had 32% of people living in Austin were, were family households. Now, in, in 2000 alone, it was only 14%, and now I'm sure it's much less. Um, we had uh, demographic shifts where we're, there, we are no longer, there is no race or ethnicity that is majority, which is a good thing for the diversity. The Asian population is rising. Um, the Hispanic and white populations are almost equal right now, but very, very problematically, we are also losing uh, African American population, and that is a very large problem. We're the only large city of uh, city of our size that's actually losing African American population, and that's because of the economics that we know, but also because of years and decades of institutional policies that created tremendous disparities in in. in, in um, some other trends that are going on, um, I think one of the things that we feel the most right now, there's a, the, the city has a, a wonderful demographer called Brian Robinson, and he calls what he calls the sharp edge of influence, of affluence, which I think we all feel really deeply, which is that we know that, that those that have things have more of them, and those that have less of things have less of them. And that's becoming, you, you see that more and more demographically as you look at the map. We can see it nationally. You know, if you look at even just, you know, Demo uh, the Democratic Party versus the Republican Party, what people sign up for and how people vote, things are becoming redder and redder and bluer and bluer. It used to be a very purple nation. But in Austin, we're really feeling that economically, and that divide is coming much more starkly, so that we are becoming much more of the city of the haves and the have-nots. And I, I think in all the stories that we'll tell today, we, we, we feel that very much on a personal level. Um, and, uh, and these things are, you know, and they're in conversation. I think this is the thing that, that's, you know, it's, it's not just that these trends are coming, but these are things that we talk about as a city and in terms of the policies we make. And, and things are here right now. There, there's one policy at the Texas legislature that's talking about, um, that would give 
the, those who own apartments, um, the ability to discriminate against who comes into the apartments based on where their income comes in. Basically, if you have a housing voucher, they can say no to you. So there are laws and conversations that are in play today that really influence who we are as a city and as a state, and um, that, that we have the ability to interact with and, and make decisions about. And those are very uh, alive and, and, and vital conversations right now. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for sort of the, the numbers and the pictures, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. And we might just be like an overt conversation, so if you feel like you want to speak to a certain topic, you can try to do well, you know, I think one thing that was left out too also is that if you look at the voting records, uh, uh, the past voting pattern is that, you know, you have the minorities that are, their turnout is very low. So that has also has been affecting how policies are made at city council because we would also work, we were at an at-large system, which because we were at-large, our, our turnout so, was being so low, our minority turnout was so low that, you know, we didn't have a voice in City Hall at that time. So, you know, and so the decisions that were being made weren't included, we weren't included at that time. Can I piggyback on that and just say that, and part of the bigger problem is voting turnout overall, is, it's terrible. And so Michael King's got an article in this week's Chronicle that really puts a fine point on the corporate welfare that's going on and how uh, those are opaque numbers about the amount of money that's being spent on the, uh, commercial properties, but the, to the best that they can estimate, taxes for the developments are about 40% of the estimated value and taxes on uh, residential homeowners are at 100% of the assessment. Value. We know that the appraisals are greatly inflated. If you'd like to come see my $330,000 house, <laughs> I'm, yes, it's like Downton Abbey over there. But um, <laughs> it's really uh, a friend of mine who works in, at, at City Hall uh, just pointed out to me, I've always voted, but she pointed out to me that, that, and I always think of this every time I go to the polls, is that people get into these big, gigantic, screaming tangles over national elections, and those are important, but that the vast majority of the things that affect us on a day-to-day -day basis happen on the city level, and people are just like, oh, I'm not going to go out and vote, and it's, and then we get screwed, you know, so I, I know it's really disheartening sometimes to go and vote, but I always, even on bad days, I'm right for myself, I don't know how we can increase voter turnout. And I would say part of that is because people aren't as informed about local politics and politicians and the issues they stand behind as Right, the Daily Show. Well, actually, the Daily Show has covered us, but I'm not on a day to day. It's it's way more in the national stuff is way more in the face. Yeah. Um, I want to just kind of throw this topic out there and, and see what you all think. Uh, the idea of growth, which is not necessarily a bad thing, I would like to uh, council member Chantelia was saying. Um, it can be good, it can be get bad, but how do we attach conscience to growth? Do you have any ideas about that, or what do you think about it? Well, I, I have a proposal that I'm going, I'm going, it's going through the city department right now, where uh, we have a state representative uh, by the name of Eddie Rodriguez, and I don't know if you all know him, but yeah, about 10 years ago, he passed a, a house bill that uh, gave the uh, city the power to create uh, what I call people's tip, which is a tax increment system where uh, we, we recaptured some of the gentrification of money that's going on, and in which the increased tax that we get from that money and reinvest it back into our neighborhood. And it's uh, it's been a long process, and I worked on that process for 10 years on the outside you know, and, and never did any work. So now I'm um, constructing a staff, and um, we're pretty close to it. Uh, I have, we have one more public hearing, and then we're going to instruct the staff to come up with establishing these kind of tips so that we can invest in affordable housing, because that's a big problem here. I mean, we, we're lacking about 40,000 units of affordable housing here in Austin. 
So there's a big demand now, and that's what's driving up all the rent prices up because people are competing for the, the scarce amount of rental housing and apartments that we have. And unless we start investing in those kind of units, and, and, and we really like doubt that we have a mayor that is really looking at the big picture and is concentrating on the big picture and is, and is urging us to co concentrate on that big picture because sometimes we get involved with school closing and you know bicycle trails and we lose the big picture and then we need to we have someone to keep keeping us focused on what's going on and he's supporting the TIF program because he knows that we could capture some of that money. That, that the increase in taxes that people are having to pay because of the gentrification that's going on and reinvest it into the neighborhood. So we're, we have a lot of these type of programs that we're working on and hopefully that uh, we only did it in the city council for just a little under five months. <laughs> yeah, but because of single member district, it's allowing us to focus in, 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 in Austin and district and we don't have that influence of the corporate money telling us, hey, you know, look out after us and, and, and not look out after the, the neighborhood. So that's just what we're doing right now. So uh, that's one of the, one of the uh, solutions that we're working on for, for this. And it's, there's many other down the line, but we're, 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 it's an early stage and, and we don't want to announce it yet until we get to that point where we know that it's going to happen and not raise false hope. And these are the kind of programs that the city is, is working on. And the change, I grew up here in Austin, and I've seen the change. You know, we, we, uh, I bought my first house right down the street here, six blocks away, for uh, 21000 and And they had two units, two houses on it. And now it's appraised at 323000 So you can see the difference there and the, and the taxes that go along with it. And I have a son that bought a house 17 years ago for uh, thirty-seven thousand, and he just sold it for three hundred and seventy-five thousand. So you can imagine, you know, the cost increase. People cannot afford these kind of homes, you know, and they can't afford the taxes. So when people offer you that kind of money, you're going to say, "Hey, I can look, go out in the outskirts and suburbs, especially toward the south, to get me a house for two hundred thousand dollars." You know, we're going to the crazy to get me a house for two hundred fifteen thousand. And so the, the inner core is just losing all its population and family. We're facing it. And I don't want to call this. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of things that I could discuss. So I don't know. Uh, just jump in. And before I jump in, I want to see if anybody wants to jump in. Please feel free. It's not just us talking. We don't have all the answers or whatever. We just wanted to raise a platform to have these discussions. It's not happening out in the open. I'd like to hear what, what this impact going on. How is it impacting the artists? Is it good for you? Is it bad? I know it's distracting the artist to the east side, but are you surviving? Like I know like how the uh, poorer population survive. They basically, you know, live six or seven people to a house or apartment. What is happening to the artist? To the artwork? I work full time to support my studio, um, which is something that I didn't think I would have to do. I thought I would be part-time. So I went away to, to graduate school hoping to bring back something to my studio. And I feel, you know, like I um, luckily have a partner who assists as, as well with my studio. But it's full-time, and in the evening it's full-time again. So when I do my travel trips to other places, I see other countries who do support their artists, um, who purchase art frequently, who other cities who give funding and support the artists to, to stay. And I don't know if I'm the only one that sees that. Um, uh, I think it's, that's, uh, I think it's true of uh, other cities. There's more private money, more foundations. San Antonio, Fort Worth, and private foundations have been in existence for a long time. They seem to do a lot of things uh, for, the, for the artists that live there, not directly, but in terms of infrastructure and and setting up programs that are specifically for artists that live in that city. You know, and Austin has always been a very welcoming city and, uh, and invites people in all the time. 
uh, but they don't always make a point of focusing on the dwarfs that actually live here in certain ways right, compared to other cities that I've seen. Uh, I've been fortunate that I started working with the state, but I didn't live in Austin because there was no work here. Uh, there was very little work as an arts educator. Uh, I don't have a master's degree, so that was really not an option for me to go teach at a university. And uh, for years, I tried to get work with the school district as an artist teacher, an artist in education. They might have one residency per year. And that was only because a nonprofit uh, initiated that program. And even to this day, uh, I guess two or three years ago, there's the mind pop people that have come in. And in my experiences with the school district itself, they make it as, as difficult as possible for the artists to actually have work. And not that they mean to, I, I don't know if they mean to or not, uh, but you know, people that take public bids, they always take the lowest bid. And they tell you, if you don't have the lowest bid, we're not gonna hire you. So I mean, there's really, there's not much of an incentive to, to do those kinds of programs that would benefit artists that live here. There's so many artists everywhere in Austin. And every, you know, every, every neighborhood school should have an artist in education. That's what myself and many other artists in the 80s, in the mid 80s through, you know, to this day, into the late 90s, that's what we tried to implement in smaller communities uh, in the state of Texas, and they did, and to, 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 to a great degree. You know, they did a lot of great things, not only in the visual arts, but in music, down in, in the Valley, San Juan uh, School with their bands, and, and they built small art, small museums and arts, and arts centers, and, they, and it was great. But then the politics took over. I mean, I don't want to name names, but we all know who. I mean, they raised all kinds of money for the, the cultural trust fund, and then the government, the governor said, well, that's my money. And so that, that, that's down the drain, or it's redirected. Unfortunately, Austin is always, you know, affected by politics, because it is a seat of, of politics, of, of the Texas uh, government. And so that, that's always been the case. And I think, I think the people that live here, or the corporations, the businesses, the school districts, the politicians, everybody involved could do a little bit more than what they have done, especially considering the great reputation, the growing reputation, because of various artists that have done things that have achieved some kind of recognition or attention from other parts of the state and the rest of the country. I think that, that there could be more done, much more done. Um, as far as making a living, I've always made a living in different ways. I worked as an artist in education. I do. Um, I guess what the term is commercial art commissions. Uh, my ideas, they pay me, to, you know, for my ideas to do whatever. It's a poster, whatever the case may may be, a mural. Uh, say as far as art sales uh, are concerned, uh, I think there could be more galleries. There could be more galleries. There could be, but you know, there's a lot of artists obviously that can survive without them, and that's really not a trend anymore. Is to be uh, in galleries hasn't really been kind of going uh, in a different direction for the last 20 years or more, because there are so many artists, and how does the reality represent all of these people? Um, so those are, you know, some of my my experiences. Um, just uh, it's it's a it's a small community, and uh, a lot of times you have to reach out beyond the community of Austin. The money is here. There's no question about it. There's tons of money, here. but do those people actually go to local galleries and buy art? And how many people even do that in any city anyway? It's a very limited market. And it's very, very competitive, it's highly competitive. It doesn't mean that you're not good. It just means you know, people make other decisions. Um, so my, my, you know, my point of view is that I've always diversified in whatever it is that I do. And I always leave myself open to other opportunities. You know, when I started working with arts and education, I could hardly stand up and speak in front of a group of people. And I started working with juvenile delinquents, and so you kind of have to speak up. <laughs> and uh, that was a great, that was a great um, experience because uh, in art school they don't really, I guess unless you go to graduate school, they teach you how to or you learn how to talk about your work and what you do, how to engage people. And they say, and I've read just recently that that's the main focus of, of graduate school these days anyway, is to socialize, and learn how to navigate the art world, you know, instead of learning how to make art. Can I say something since I just left graduate school and I went back? It's not really about that so much. I mean, you really get the feel of the real art world because everybody's fighting for this one piece of quant. And they do, 
employed you to learn how to talk about your work because the art world has changed and, and the world is smaller. So if you can't talk about your work and make work that's relevant and that can cross many mediums, then, then graduate school is not for you. But that's what people out there in the art world want from you. And I have a unique story because I was a practicing artist in Austin. That's all I did before I went to graduate school. And it is really tough to make art and money in Austin. And I'm African American, so I have two things working against. And I'm a woman, so I have three strikes on it. <laughs> so so it, it was really hard to do those types of things. But you just have to you're right. You have to figure out ways to make money. You have to, you know, I did educational art alongside my other art. I traveled, I went out and I sought out shows. So a lot of work artists have to do in Austin. But there isn't a place for all artists in Austin. We know that. I mean, we have Mexicarte, we have the Mac, we have the Carver Museum, and you know, I can go on about the Carver. It's just, the thing is, if we don't have an opportunity to show our work, then you're right, we have to seek other avenues. So we have to, and I think in Austin, you know, it's really tough to be an African American artist. I mean, I've only been back a year, and I'm even thinking I don't need to be there anymore. It's not enough diversity. You know, people don't understand the work that people do, and because they have it, it's not in contact with their everyday life. If they never see a black person, then they can't understand the work that I do. I mean, we can all, you know, get to a point on humanism. We can understand hurt and and racism and things like that. But if you don't dialogue with someone in the store or something like that, you don't understand their work. So there's no place for you here. So I think that's one of the things we have to work. Yeah. And you're right, African Americans are running out of this, this city like, I mean, I think it's five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it may be six. Okay. Well, can I just tie into the housing to an individual thing? I was, when the internet got big that maybe building to make a living as a writer became very difficult, and I stumbled into the job I do now, which is I perform weddings and funerals. Kind of funny. It's a great job, but it allows me to do my writing without having to bang on doors and beg people for money to write basically commercial work that doesn't speak to what I want to do. Uh, because I, because of this accidental stumble into this work that I do, and because it gives me both time and money, I've been I've come into the very fortunate position from having been this very poor single mother to somebody who has. Uh, I'm I'm not rich, but I'm just saying compared to what I used to be, like I could um, I can spend fifty dollars at the grocery store now. You know? So what I like to do is spread it around, and I write a lot of checks every year to organizations like Portland Dance Works, the Shakespeare programs, KTX, which that trickles out to local music stuff. Um, as my to, to kind of go off on a little tangent on I rescue dogs and Dante in my Labrador when I got him, he was a surrender and his alleged story was that his human said that because his taxes went up he could no longer afford his dogs. And at the time I thought that's just BS, you don't do that. And now I'm at a point where I have to stop, I mean I'll keep the dogs, but I have to stop, I have to cut back somewhere. So I'm going to be writing fewer, I also buy local water, so I have to if I want to stay in my house, then I've got to cut back in the checks that I'm writing to other artists, and that bums me out. And to, and to be really honest, I am thinking about selling my house. I would much rather sell my house, live in the outskirts of town, and still be able to contribute to the artist community that's even left, than to keep my stakes in a you know a hip that ain't now hip. Um. Privilege of having people who direct um, art spaces here in town. Do you guys have any take on this? I mean, you, you, you both are also artists. So. Yeah, I, I feel like um, circling back to like, how artists survive and make a living, um, one of the, the major avenues for uh, revenue is through selling your art. As a, I mean, you can go out and get a job and work in the kitchen and commission, but it does usually come down to that. To, but the majority of your income comes from selling your work. Um, so for the longest time, we all said more galleries, more opportunities, uh, more people, more patrons. How do we get more collectors? How do we educate collectors? And how do we get them to come and buy our art? And a lot of that came through wealth 
the city gets bigger and for our fluid, then we attract that audience to us. We just have to grow what we have. We have to have a broader spectrum of patron types to possibly buy our work. Well, it's sort of synonymous to gentrification in general. That's as more people came, then we raised the, the cost of living. And yes, there are people out there buying your work, but now it costs more for you to live your life and to make your work. So there's no, we're not catching up to the, the curve. It's just constantly skirting away from us as we're trying to make enough money through our art sales to, to these new people who are coming to town who have the means to buy it, but their general impact on the city is causing more damage than their contribution back into the creative sector. So, I, I mean, beyond like destroying capitalism, I don't know how to... <laughs> <laughs> we've, got, we've got a solution. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What you we, we, you're talking about is that desire for growth to help see an artist's living and how it mirrors gentrification and, and what we wanted is what it, what we wanted it became the evil that we didn't want. But I think that talks back to the topic that you brought up initially was growth and consciousness. And for me, gentrification starts out at its root with displacement. But I think that's what actually feels so wrong about what's happening. It's like people who have already been in an area or stayed in an area are getting just kicked out because of because of growth, like being irresponsible growth. It's like whatever whoever can write the biggest check they should have the best toy. And in this place is property. And, and I've always seen, thought it was amazing. When I first got here, it was 2008, and I was told that, like I was talking earlier, that Riverside, don't go to Riverside, don't go there. Mm -hmm. And this was as early as 2008. And it never made sense to me, not because, like, I'm, this, the area didn't seem that bad at all, but how close it was to downtown. And that was, like, the way cities were being told, this is how you're going to revitalize your city, is to recharge your urban center. You want, you want that model. You don't want urban sprawl. You want everything happening in your core. You want people to come downtown. And the fact that all of East Austin is kind of being ignored, but it was, it's right there. And so just this influx of money was gonna, is, is aware of that. It's like, that's going to change. It has to change. It's like the fact that, it was, that Austin was segregated um, by decree, really. We have that plan that said, let's put all the brown people over there. Um, but now that, that, that property has become so valuable, it's who can never write the biggest check because they want to be downtown. And I think what Beale is doing is, is trying to do responsible growth. But unfortunately, I think it's not just a local problem, it's also a state problem. It's a national problem because these issues aren't just happening in Austin, they're happening in San Francisco, they're happening in New York. It's why, it's why actually the art world is kind of shifting now from New York to LA. I think because artists can't afford New York, they're using Philadelphia as a as a suburb of New York, which is crazy. But LA is actually cheaper just to live than New York is, and I think that's why that shift is happening. That artistic shift, or more interesting things, more the art of love to blossom, because you can actually survive in New York. or LA. So I'm, a, I'm cynical and I'm pessimistic. So when you're saying that. <laughs> It was weird that Riverside was being ignored or you know being told you no know, don't go there. Because I'm so cynical, it's like it's it was by design. It's you know they knew that it's so close to downtown that its its proximity is valuable. You think they let it go? So yeah, no, totally. It's you know you can't you can't make something attractive until you know it's it's. They had to lower the value first before they said, hey, look, this is really valuable. And, um, and I bring that up because I feel like that's my understanding of what happened with Rainy Street. Um, and there's a history here that I guess it just doesn't get talked about. And honestly, I found out about this not too long ago, but the, the Gladys Lincoln building and the mural that was there. And, you know, that echoed the recent destructions of murals on the east side. And, and that's really, you know, that's why I wanted the history of the Mac to be told and, and someone who I, I'm sure you were able to actually see the flyers. Oh, yeah, yeah. That so was the, the one of y'all, or both of y'all. Impressions of Austin was, uh, probably in Austin you would see the, 
Actually, I think if you drove in from the north going south, you could see the mural because it was facing north on the, the Lincoln Plaza Institute, which is where uh, I think uh, right across or right by the, uh, the iPod is now. So yeah, that was a, a very significant, I think, thing. It's right here, it's it's right on the iPod. But it was also the, uh, mm -hmm. it was the first Baptist church and where the, uh, when the Anglos actually, uh, where they built the park, man. And they were going to make the uh, town lake area the, the entertainment area for Austin to have the Twitter bonds and all that. So they uh, they moved down out of East Austin back then. And the church itself, you know, was to rebuild itself. So they, what is Lincoln, which was a college that was established, came from uh, from, the, from San Juan down by the border. Actually, they expanded out and, they, and that became a college. And a lot of the uh, Chicanos started attending the schools there. And then the local neighborhood was going. And as our old Valdez actually painted the mural there. And, uh, but when they lost the certification, we couldn't keep that building open anymore. So, we lost the building, and so the developer said, we have no use for that building, and they actually came, came with the bulldozers and bulldozed the building. Yeah, yeah. So that's basically part of the history, but they also had theater. That, that's what really excited the, uh, the, the body of the neighborhood here, and really started working with the, the artists, the Chicano artists that came into Austin. You know, they came from, from, from the valley, from, you know, from, from all on the border, from Dallas, from all over. They were going to school at UT, but they also found, saw that because it was a church, it also had a theater there. So we were having a teatro, Chicano, and uh, artists started performing there. So it, and they, it was free for the, for, for the neighborhood radio, and then uh, Rainy was an all Chicano neighborhood also. So it was all walking distance, and that's what really excited us. And we decided that what we needed was a permanent uh, performance place. And so we started the concept and the idea of having our own, um, which is now the MAC. Yeah. But basically what the MAC was all about was to have and, and to reach out to our local artists, to come to artists, and have them, give them a place to do their, their to sell their artwork, to their performance, so that our kids can to learn the cultural and, and grow up with the art culture. So that was the whole concept on it. Unfortunately, you know, it's the city plan. It was a bond election. We had a lot of problems, so they put it under the arcs, the parks department, which is, I, I could never understand why it's under the parks department, you know, because. So the cultural arts, or the parks is under, it's cultural arts under the parks also? No, economics is under the Economics, no. Can you change that? <laughs> right. You did. Maybe that separate you know, that, that's separate into your department. My association with the MAC is that we don't have, there's no budget to really advertise or to promote certain things. And it makes, yeah, you're right, it kind of hamstrings you. You can't do the whole, you can't do a whole lot. Yeah, and I'm, I'm trying to change that also. We have a, a dream about using that little vacant parking lot that you expect in front of the MAC. Uh, that you can have the parking and bicycle to actually put one of the historic homes here in Rainier if it ever gets to that point where there, there's one to be moved and put it there so that we can make it into a visitor center so artists can, you know, also exhibit their work that would be like a little gallery that you can recycle all your art, you know, every two or three months and, and also have a, little, a coffee area or something where people can come and ask you to come through that place and, that you'll have all the information and the history of Rainy, and also uh, the history and information about the MAC, and also what's being there and what's being exhibited. And uh, so right now, if people come, and they, they kind of wander around, and then if they come to our, the office, there's one person behind the counter, there, but there's nothing there for them. You know, the, the history. You know, you can go to the gallery upstairs, say, oh, yeah, the gallery's upstairs, but What's, what's there? I mean, what's here? I, 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 you know, I want to see that. I want to change that. You know, I want to, I want to so make it more money. alive. Yeah, I, I, yeah. We need some money. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and that's why we started also the Latino Arts and Residency Program here, which the staff had to also, in order to understand where we're going, we have to understand our history. 
And so our, the staff had to understand the history. We, had, we knew about the, the, all, everything that was happening and had happened uh, with the Lincoln Juarez um, uh, University. And Lucha was there too, Lucha House there. And, and everything that um, developed, and it developed so quickly. Um, and as staff was beginning to program everything here, we wanted to keep that alive, and that was by bringing in more artists to participate and work together and network. And so we started this program, the Latino Arts and Residency Program, where we could, and we worked with City Council on this to get it approved and to get funding. And I believe we got about $50,000 to hire a coordinator to manage the program where artists could uh, apply for this program. Now there's four uh, theater groups and soon we'll have two visual artists. One will be Raul Valdez and uh, Nathan Nordstrom who will basically reside here. They, you know, they, they rehearse, they have, um, you know, as in terms of visual artists, we're still trying to figure that out because we also know that visual artists also have lost their studio spaces. And I don't know how you all work on, you know, in, on your work without studio spaces, because I know a lot of artists also lost their studio spaces because of affordability. And so that's one of the things that we see as a need here too. But I was telling Pio, we need to get on the next bond election because the MAC is not complete. We have a, a beautiful building that is not complete, and we can't have the same thing happen to us as it did with the Carver. The Carver is still not complete. And to us, that's disrespectful to just let us hang and not have our, our complete dream complete. And that means more studio spaces, that means more gallery space, and who knows what else we can, you know, I mean, I think things are going to change now that the city has changed, now that there's different needs than there was, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. That now when we think about completing the, the MAC, which is, when you really look at it, it's like this magnificent piece of artwork, which it is, um, that we really think about all, all everything that's happened and everything that's going to happen, because we have to think about the future too, and what those needs um, for the artists. But I also believe that this is one of the reasons we love working with most outsiders, is because not only do we have these discussions, but it's about unity. It's about bringing everybody that's hurting, that has a need, to have these discussions and to fill that void. And, you know, I really, really, truly want to finish the MAC. We are already. Um, we're just over, we're overbooked, and we don't have enough. You know, we're understaffed. We don't have enough money for programming um, to do all the things that we want to do. I mean, it's just it's just not enough right now for for everything. And with all the development, we're having a 35-story condo building right in front of the map in the next two years. So that's even more reason to finish the map um, because that build that. Uh, condo building is just going to overtake us. I mean, you're going to come in, that's the first thing you're going to see. Um, but if we complete the map, I think it's just going to set another statement for the people around here. And um, I just, you know, it's just something that needs to be done for all of us. <coughs> yeah, I, no, no, I, I gotta run in a minute. I'm really sorry that I keep going in, but I, I guess to speak to that, um, I just wrote a couple points down while I was listening in. I know that long-term solutions need to be worked out, but I'm also a big fan of trying to do some triage. And toward that end, you know, I go to retail a lot. I go to restaurants when I can. And I've been asking people, how do you afford to stay here? You're not making much money. There's an open letter out right now. Retail employees are trying to get a uh, universal um, living wage happening. Hopefully something like LA will happen here soon. Um, but I, I this sounds very selfish. I can't bear the thought of having a long-term roommate, but what I've told the young people in Eastville, and I tell some waiters there I know is, they tell me they're going to get pushed out soon. Just one worker told me she's in a house on the edge of Hyde Park. It's 950 a month. Her landlord said, you can keep this house until I sell it, and it's going to be raised. It's going to be soon. I can't tell you when. I can only tell you when won't raise the rent. So it, she could get into this any moment to leave. I told her, um, and I'm telling this, I'm saying this in public on purpose, 
I do have room in my house for short-term people to stay, so if somebody gets suddenly pushed out of their house, rather than have to just jump into a crappy housing situation if you need a week or two to get the bearings, I'm trying to make space for that, or make space for writers to come and write, um, because I just can't live with anybody, but I can make a little bit of space for people. And I, and, and in Austin, we really do take care of each other, and right, and right now we're so busy trying to like, paddle furiously to take care of ourselves, I'm afraid that we're going to lose some. So the other connectivity I just wanted to say is that I have a slogan, uh, volunteering doesn't pay. <laughs> and, uh, but, and I know it's important to pay people what they're worth to do their work, but in the interim, uh, if your organization or another arts organization is <coughs> doing marketing, writing, or have for publicity, that's my specialty. I'm happy to volunteer some you know, time and resources as part of the triage, and I, you know, so just putting that. And I thank you very much for that. Sorry, I'm leaving you on stickers. Tell me, anybody needs help? Um, what was the, the question you started with? Um, how, meaningful growth? Or? Growth and conscience. Growth and conscience. And, and I think, um, Part of that, and getting to your point about like needing funding for the MAC and the Carver and all of that, is that I don't think as a city, not, not in this room, but as a city, we really have a conversation or a recognition of how much the arts are a part of us or how much they are integral to who we are as a city. Everyone who's coming here thinks, oh, Austin, it's hip. It's, you know, that's where everyone has all these ideas and everything is so cool. And, and yet, we know in this room that we're right now we're using all of that. And yet that resonance, that, that ability to say that with the meaning outside of this hall, it isn't really there. And so when we go and the bonds come up and we say, we need X number of million for this project or that project to, to help support artists and housing and studio space, it, it's, it's not there. And, and, I think, and I think that's a conversation that I know that you know bring, bringing the you know the arts into the conversations about the city are not always things that people jump up for joy about, but um, but it, it, I think it's really it's a really important conversation to have about this um, the just how much the arts are an integral part of who we are from from the ground to the top. And, um, and I would even say that it's an expansion of the conversation I have with someone who works in real estate or in Austin. Um, and she was saying that developers are buying up these properties, um, she was speaking specifically to South Mar, and tearing down like these cultural institutions, well, not like arts institutions, but like, you know, bars that have been here for years and like have a certain culture around them. And they're tearing them down to build condos, but people are moving to that area to have those amenities. And if they're gone, then why would they move there? But how do we how do we express that? How can we do that? I think a lot of it is is engaging with city hall. I, I think when when I talk with people a lot, you know, I hear the term the city, and you know, oh, the city does this or the city does that, and, and it's and it's kind of like it's this big monolith, and you know that sort of moves down the road. But in fact, the city is actually so many different people. A lot of them really really care. You know, something in this room right here, and um, and you know, and so much of it is about just getting it, like figuring out that policy idea. What is it? Having the conversation with the council member, being there at the meetings, and you know, sort of entering into those zones where we don't really go. And but you'd be amazed at how much agency there really is in being able to engage in those conversations. They, they, they really are. People want want in city hall want to hear those conversations. They want that advocacy there. They want that voice. They they want a really clear, articulate, intelligent voice that says, "Hey, we all love the same thing, and and we know how to help." And, um, well, and I think it's also a voice of hearing our voices. Yes, hearing you know the stories. stories. Because sometimes I don't think people hear them enough. And I don't think we, we know each other enough sometimes and get into each other's worlds enough to understand what's really happening. And that's why unity and these kind of discussions, continuous discussions, not just today, 
not just you know next month, but like a real structure um, where there's there is a structure, there is a movement of of us or you know whatever. Um, I think that's the only way that you know we can get heard. Yeah, and in um, unlikely places too, right? Just places that you wouldn't you know you wouldn't normally go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just have to speak up in defense of the city. Uh, Lynn, you said that the city didn't pay attention to the arts in our bond elections. But this building came about because of the money that we raised in the bond elections, in two different elections, and also the Carver, and also uh, Zach Scott, and there have been other uh, projects that we funded through the general obligation bonds. Oh, no, I, I, but I want to point out and make an important point to the audience. One of the problems that Austin sticks out as is that we spend 70% of our budget on public safety. And we're an outlier among other cities that only spend about 50%. And why we have, uh, why we have to uh, eke out money for other things like the arts, which are very important, is because we spend a disproportional amount on public safety. I'd love to hear what City Council Renteria has to say about that. And it's, it's very true that we, we do have a, a, we spend a huge amount on public safety. I, I don't know if it's totally 70 percent. It's 69 but, point something. Yes, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, and to tell you the truth, that uh, fire councilmen have um, paid the police. The, uh, I mean, they have, they have earned a huge amount of money. They're probably the highest paid uh, police peace officers here in the state of Texas, and their benefits are very generous, but they also have a very strong union, and because of their, their, their way they lobby and, their, and the money they have, including the firefighters, you know, everybody knows firefighters after 9-11, but, uh, you know, that's, and it's that actually true, where that's where all the money is, is going, and, and, and they, it's the union that's very powerful, and, and we don't have that. And, and the artists, I mean, they're, they're struggling and they don't have the kind of wealth that they're able to contribute to the union, even though union is a dirty word here in Texas. The reality is that, yes, there are, are unions here and they do take, they lobby and they get their officials elected and they have a lot of influence in City Hall. And that, yes, the past council has given them, been very generous to them. And, and, uh, and, also, the state kind of limits us on, on what we can raise the next year after year after year. You know, we're, we can't raise taxes. Or, uh, we have to keep, uh, uh, they call it a, a tax neutral, which you have to, revenue neutral, where you have to bring in the same amount of revenue plus a certain percentage every year. So you have to, even though your property value is increasing here, we cannot raise, we have to lower the tax rate so that we can meet the, we can only generate the same amount of revenue coming in as we did the year before and then rely on the sales tax and the added value that comes in, that bumps up that money. And now you got every other agency, social service and everybody else fighting over that. Arts is one of them. And, and it's a big struggle the way the, the state has limited us on what we can and can't do. And then, you know, we have a, a the state has a policy of taking the Robin Hood, where they take a huge amount of wealth from our property rich cities like Austin, and next year we're facing like $225 million that we're gonna have to give back to the state. So it's putting a lot of stress here at Austin because that money that we could have lowered the tax rate so that we could have some extra funds. Now we're, we're we're venturing into, you know, in some of our bond elections, into, you know, doing programs for the school because we know if the school system does it, they have to give a, a certain amount of that money back to the state. Where the city, in its bond elections, is, you know, we don't have to do those kind of things. So it's it's a really struggle, and I hope that the police officers, when they come here at budget time that they don't ask for a huge increase anymore because they're, they're one of the best paid officers there is. So Maybe they also stipulate that some of that money goes towards the arts through the police department. And that's why, I, <laughs> and I want to warn you guys that 
If the budget season has started and we're already being lobbied hard by, by all these agencies, nonprofits, and everything else that's coming in, and y'all need to really start getting out there and start getting in contact with your councilmen. And I think that the Arts Alliance and your project here is one of the reasons why y'all decided to attach to each district rep, each member, council member, so that y'all get to know them, they get to know you, and, and the artists, so that when it comes down to, you know, that's the budget crunch, when it comes down to a final, that they do put some money in there for the artists, or added budget. If I could defend Lynn real quick, I think she was saying that and I believe it also that the city does provide some arts resources. Yes, we do have the carpet, we do have the map. These are things that the city has, has as a whole, we've collectively decided these are valuable and we need to nurture those things. But I think the point that Lynn was saying is that how the city does that is by us giving voice to the city and saying this is what we need. Maybe as an arts um, scene or an arts group, we need to do a better job of that. And that's what uh, I think Bill was talking about. Lobbying is happening now. The louder voices are getting the more money. The people, the firefighters, the police officers, they're getting more money because they're organized, they're unionized. But ours isn't. But also at the same time, what we need to do is let, and I think this is a, a problem that we had just with the exhibition, with, with this uh, this part, the symposium, and just arts in general is letting, is also letting and connecting with the city in general as a whole. Not just those people who are interested in art, not just those people who are interested in their specific niche, whatever, craft or, or jewelry design or whatever. Um, there's a way of engaging everybody, the mom and pop, the, the kid in high school or whatever, that arts are just as important as traffic, as housing, as, as, as everything else. And I think that's where our real issue is, is, letting, is getting, getting to that level to where we're engaging everybody. But I, I have no idea how to do that. Anyway, you can. I, I, I think it's a story of um, in, in the city. Um, affordable housing, uh, folks who do affordable housing, if you do affordable housing, you, you've got to do it. That, that's your job. It, it's really intricate financing. Um, and so they're, they're really organized as a group, and they've got institutions that, that they work within. The folks working on parks in Austin, up until a couple years ago, really weren't organized at all. You know, everyone, like, they had, you know, like, this little conservancy and this group. And, and a couple of years ago, a number of parks advocates got together and they said, hey, the city is densifying. And really, when things, when fights happen between, like, a city owns a parcel of land and that could either go to affordable housing or parks, parks most likely lose. Um, and because we need affordable housing, but also because there's just not a larger voice of, uh, you know, for advocating for these open spaces. And so just a group of people got together. And started and, and started acting around the time of the budget. And a couple of years ago, we got over four million dollars added to the city budget for parks because we went. We talked with council members and we figured out, like, okay, what were the council members? What were they? What were their concerns? And then developed this, this platform that said, okay, these are the these are the top three things that really need to be advocated for. And then kept going back and, and went to council meetings, went to uh, political meetings. And then, and lo and behold, it worked. I mean, I, I'll, I'll admit, we were shocked. Um, but it was, it was really amazing, because it was really just a group of people who had always known each other, you know, had worked together, you know, for years, or, you know, sort of parallel. Um, and then just finally said, you know what, we, we, we have to come together to give voice and have a conversation. And, and it has to be one that happens with work. That's great because I was going to ask, like, what would an art union look like, or what would an art lobbyist group look yeah. like? I mean, because I know that there's Austin Creative Alliance, um, there's Art Alliance, Fuse Box. I mean, the big medium, all these arts groups, they're doing big things. They have come before me and they set up meetings, and I've had meetings with them, so they are lobbying many people on there. Mm -hmm. The Art Alliance and I think a couple other All you got, you just all you have to really do is uh, call and schedule meetings, bring bring your your group organization and and meet meet with all the council. You, just, you can set it up where you, you know you can schedule maybe two or three council meetings the same day so that y'all don't have to be coming back and forth to downtown. 
But y'all can and just, you know, call us and say, hey, we want to have a meeting. And they'll schedule one with you. And that's, that's a start there. Just go out there and tell them what you're doing. And make a quick, put a, a quick presentation together. And, and the best thing about when you go to one of these conferences, make sure that you have an idea of what you want and what kind of budget you're going to need because that's what's important. You know, then the council members will say, hey, we know how much money that this group is going to need, this group is going to need, and they can start putting their, you know, that together. And when it comes down, you know, I mean, we know what's going on, but, you know, there's an old saying in Spanish, if you know, in Spanish, if you know, I'm learning real slow, you know, so now you've got to, those that don't speak up, now you've got to hear you, so that's uh, something that I really need to do, and, you know, I encourage y'all to go out and do it for us. Yes. Yeah, I was also going to suggest this is something that I don't see. We all, all of us that are involved with arts organizations, we all get cultural contract money. I think it's really important every year to thank your count, all members of council for those funds because they're always at risk every couple of years. Somebody always wants part of them. And then also invite your council member, not only have a meeting with them, but invite every, like make it an effort or someone on your board to always invite a council member to your events as you have done today. Because I think that with all of these organizations, there's a huge disconnect with that. But I was just going to suggest that. Yeah, so. that's a good point. That's and even invite Mr. Zimmerman. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Well, back to our own one, I think that's what we were doing with this exhibition. Mm -hmm. That's some of the things that we were trying to do is, is try to engage others that we normally just run with in our own circles. Because even within the visual arts scenes, it's broken up into little pockets of clicks and things like that. And I think what we were trying to do is get break those walls down and get people who go to, go to this type of exhibition to intermingle with other people going to that type of just having this platform to have this dialogue with hopefully another way to break down that that separation that is just it just happens. And you see on just a quick take I wish that or Houston policy can help me do something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there. I'm Chris Session from the policy of the Council Member Houston. <laughs> Thanks for making it out. <laughs> Weren't you also running for the place? <clears throat> yeah. No, but you know, then I, you know, I listened to her, listened to what she had to say, and we matched up. Yeah, that's, that's All right. Good. Yeah. I'm going to meet with a guy named Roger from her office. You know Roger. It's a guy named Roger who's going out into the district to talk to people in the neighborhoods about whatever we may feel may need to be addressed. A man named Danny Roger. Excuse me. No, I haven't heard of him. Yeah, it's a guy named Roger. <coughs> I don't know. I haven't heard anything about that. I do land use and economic development and housing and that kind of thing. Um, something I was, I was going to mention was uh, what you were talking about, about how you know, to interact with other groups and things that you wouldn't typically go see or do. Um, I think it's a big, it was, a, it was awful, I think. In the late 80s, early 90s, that the, there was an effort to build. And, and I think one of the problems that Austin has right now is that, aside from the Blanton, there's not a collecting museum. So there's really no reason for poor people to buy work other than for their homes. They're not going to they're not going to donate to an institution. There's no, locally, I mean, there isn't one, unless they donate to UT. And that's about it. But I, as I recall, in the late 80s, early 90s, it was a big effort to have a museum. <laughs> That would be run, that would be partly the Carver, the Mac, and the Green Glory. And it seemed like it was going to happen because that would that means that everybody would be in on the deal. It would all everybody would have access to it. And then, you know, when there was prospects of bigger money coming in, that all fell apart because certain people didn't want to play with the other groups of people. You know, and I think that's that was a big mistake that happened, you know, 20, 30 years ago almost. And I, I hope that there's some effort to make something like that, where there is a reason for a variety of people to go and to be part of, whether it's by location um, or by design. But I, I think that's a very good point. 
And that, and that's a little history behind that too. Also. Oh, there's a lot of yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, they didn't want to give us the map. And they didn't want to give us this land here. And, and, and they were saying it was too valuable. So they wanted to build one downtown and put all the different races, you know, black, brown, and, and bang, whatever, was Laguna Gloria. And, uh, and my body was so involved with that discussion. And, and, and yes, it's true, it, did, it didn't go anywhere. And, but there's a plus to it also, because we got the map. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it, it, it did come to be, so. But, uh, but yeah, I, I congratulate all the way all have done. In your work, and trying to involve other people, and inviting people to actually talk about the work, you know, and there's, that really happens. I mean, people, they look at things, but they don't really talk about what's behind all this activity. Yes, sir. I am doing also, what is the map? What? If Laura was here, she would have corrected us. There's Mexicarte and then there's the map. Mexicarte down on 5th and Congress. Oh, oh, see, yeah, I read it. I read a lot. So I read it. The Carver, I, I have read about that in the newspaper in the last two months. What is the Carver? Carver Museum on Angelina Street and uh, Rosewood. 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 I have read about this also. That's why I came today. Thank you for the newspaper. We'll get you a brochure. <laughs> what? We'll get you a brochure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there we go. Look, here's the before and after. I have a